like this before. Let's see what we're gonna do here. Extend right out. All right, cool. Well, uh, it's awesome to be here this morning. Um, and uh, obviously, typically, it is Rennell who would be preaching to you on Sunday. Uh, so I am not Rennell. Um, I am Aaron. And, uh, but I am encouraged to be here because, as you guys know, the plan is for Charmaine and I to move to New Hampshire. And, uh, and it's actually very exciting. So Charmaine and I have already been applying to different places. Um, God willing, we'll be signing a lease actually today. Yeah. So uh, after church, uh, about 4 o'clock, we're going to be going over to... Uh, you know, our prayerfully new place where we're going to be signing a lease to be moving in on December 15th. Wow. Uh, the Pattersons were accepted to take over our lease in Boston. So the Pattersons will come in December 15th, literally move into our apartment uh, in Austin, and then we'll be moving here to New Hampshire. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, now it's crazy because the apartment that God willing, we're going to sign a lease for is a four bedroom, three bathroom house. Nice. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're just like, we're like, what in the world? And not only is it this four bedroom, three bathroom house, but it's literally right next to University of New Hampshire. Yeah. Yeah. So you walk out, you leave the neighborhood, and then you walk down the street and you're on campus. Yes. It, it's, it's like crazy. So I can ride my bike to campus in like five minutes. <laughs> it, it's, it's crazy. It's closer to UNH than our current apartment is to Boston University. Uh, yeah. So, so God has just really been moving and uh, we're very excited, of course, uh, for all the plans. We're excited for my and Chanel to be in Boston. Yeah. Uh, I mean, honestly, I think God has really orchestrated a plan here for the Northeast that's that's honestly beyond our imagination. <laughs> and, uh, and and really, it's it's quite an opportunity. It's an opportunity to really help New Hampshire to solidify, to become an official region. Because yeah. up to this point, it's a house church, but we haven't been able to have our own budget in New Hampshire. We haven't been able to have our own services in New Hampshire really for more than one time a week, uh, a month. Sorry, <laughs> one time a week. Uh, one time a month, but now when Charmaine and I actually come up here and the Pattersons come and then we roll out the whole plan, we'll be having services in New Hampshire three times a month. Yeah. So we'll have our own building. Woo. You know, I mean, the Dawson's house is amazing, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure they're fired up and you are fired up too at, <laughs> at the prospect of having a building. You know, yes. uh, no, no, we don't own the building, but you know what I mean. Uh, we'll be able to meet uh, in, a, in a building that we don't live in, right? And, and so that'll be very, very encouraging. Uh, and so God has a lot of good plans, right? Yeah. So I'm very encouraged about that. Let's go to Acts chapter four. Yeah, yeah. Come, on. Come on. Now, uh, I'm also very encouraged because, I mean, Renell and Danielle have already been doing a pretty phenomenal job. Yeah. yeah. And uh, especially on campus, I think uh, at the beginning of the semester, it was really a great um, opportunity for the Dorvals to finally get on the ground at UNH and it's been amazing. I mean, Samir got baptized. Yeah. Then Eli got baptized. Yeah. I hear the good news that Brian is like right around the corner. Uh, this, I guess, Isaac, who yeah. I haven't met yet, but I hear he's said in the Bible. He's right around the corner. Uh, I'm hearing uh, about Paulette and Michelle and, and just people, people that want to be baptized, right? They want to be disciples at UNH. So that's very encouraging. And, and so even our, our hope and really our prayer, and this is what we've desired for a long time, is that Charmaine and I can continue to uh, really raise up the Dorables, but now we get to walk with them, mm -hmm. which is something that we've never been able to do up to this point. So we can actually be on campus with them and help them and train them while we're actually with them, which it's yeah. pretty difficult to do, you know, to help train and raise somebody up when you're not really physically there. Mm -hmm. uh, but this gives us a, a, a totally new opportunity to work with them. So Acts chapter four. Come on. Acts chapter four, starting in verse eight. Now, the title of the lesson is Responsibility. And uh, as disciples, we have a great responsibility. Now, you know the great Spider-Man quote, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, and uh, that's like the old school Spider-Man quote. But, uh, but it's, uh, it's just true. When, when you have power, you have great responsibility. Now, this is a great passage here in Acts chapter 4, verse 8. I think it'll inspire all of us. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, that's the power right there, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. We'll stop right there. Wow. You know, the apostles had been given a great responsibility. The responsibility was to evangelize the world in their generation. Now, they had to do that without the internet, without... <laughs> Toyota Priuses, you know what I mean? Nice. With, with literally, they just had to wear their sandals and walk all over the world and preach the word. But what did they have? They had the Holy Spirit and they had walked with Jesus Christ. And so what it says in the Bible is that these unschooled and ordinary men did something totally extraordinary. Wow. And that's encouraging because you think about, okay, are we going to evangelize the world? Like, Like, that's what we're trying to do in the 21st century. We're trying to evangelize our generation. And I think a lot of times we can look at ourselves in the mirror, maybe you can relate to me, and you can say, well, how's this guy going to evangelize the world? How's that going to happen? Well, because it's the Holy Spirit working in the lives of ordinary people. And when you have the Holy Spirit, an ordinary person becomes an extraordinary person. Come on. Not because they're awesome, not because we are schooled, uh, or maybe we are, but it doesn't mean we're awesome even if we are. Yeah. But it's because we have the Holy Spirit working Come in our on. life. Now, the responsibility is pretty phenomenal. I mean, it says salvation is found in no other name under heaven. Mm-hmm. There is no other way to be saved than to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. And yeah. that's why it's a great responsibility. Because that means that there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of people who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's up to the disciples to make sure that they can find it. Um, Point number one is the responsibility of discipleship. Mm. Now, it's laid out here that obviously, you know, step one of having a relationship with Jesus is that you have to believe in him, right? And, And we know this, but we also know from great Bible study that it's not an intellectual belief. So it's not just acknowledging that Jesus is the son of God that magically makes you saved, but it's a belief that leads to what we would call a conviction to become a disciple of Jesus, right? Now, a conviction is interesting, uh, and I think it's interesting because I'm a lawyer, but, uh, you know, if you study out, say, you know, your first amendment rights uh, Mm -hmm. under the constitution, well, one of your rights is that you have the freedom to practice your religion in, in the United States of America. But the Supreme Court has ruled that it will not recognize that your beliefs are protected by the First Amendment unless they are, quote unquote, a conviction. And it says they are not considered a conviction under the law unless you are willing to die for them. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. So you have to be willing to die for them. You have to be willing to be imprisoned for them. You have to be basically willing to be persecuted for them. But if under the threat of persecution, you change your mind, then that's not a conviction. Wow. And so that will not be protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution. Wow. Pretty interesting, right? <laughs> and it, it says, it, it basically what the court has ruled, that if you're not willing to die for it, then it's not a conviction, it's a preference. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's wow. pretty convicting, right? Wow. And so I think we live in a generation where we have a lot of preferences. Yes. Yeah. But not a whole lot of convictions. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. And I think this is definitely true in the religious world yeah. and in the Christian world. And so a lot of people intellectually believe in God. A lot of people intellectually believe in Jesus. But when the rubber hits the road, when they're under threat, when there's some persecution, when there's some hardship, you can find out whether or not that's a conviction or whether or not that's just a preference. And I think a lot of times it's just a preference until we undergo that hardship and it reveals where we're really at. Uh, We've been having some great Bible studies on campus, and I mean, some of our Bible studies at Boston University are intense. Yeah. If you've ever, if you've ever (laughs) attempted to evangelize BU, uh, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty atheistic type of campus. Um, And for those that do believe in God, it's, it's very like, uh, it does lack (laughs) conviction. Let me just put it like that. And I was having a conversation with one guy. And, uh, and he was being very sentimental and he, supposedly he's a Christian and all this stuff. And, and he's talking to me. He's like, so let me ask you a question. Do you believe that Muslims are going to go to heaven or go to hell? 
And I'm like, oh, here we go, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and so in my, I pause, and in my mind, I process. All the calculations are going in the back of my head. And I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, so I can have like a three-hour conversation where I beat around the bush right here, <laughs> or I can just tell them what the Bible says. And so I just told him, I said, no, Muslims go to hell. They don't go to heaven. And the guy flips out. <laughs> and this guy's supposed to be a Christian. And he starts telling me, he's like, you call yourself a Christian? <laughs> And you believe that Muslims are going to go to hell? He's like, if you even read the Bible? That's what he said to me. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like what is going on right here? Like, have you ever read the Bible? Like, you have no idea what you're talking about. Anyway, it, was, uh, it got pretty ugly. And what made it worse is that we were sitting in a booth, and uh, he was on the inside of the booth, and Tayo was oh, basically no. blocking his exit. Oh, God. And this was all unintentional. Like, nobody knew that this was going to happen. But then all of a sudden, like, it got, it went from, like, zero to 100 really fast. Oh, this guy's, like, yelling at me, and Tayo's boxing him in. <laughs> and I'm like, Tayo, you should like this. And then he, like, he's like, I got to get out of here. And then he left, and we've never seen him again. Amen. <laughs> but uh, there's preferences and there's convictions, right? Amen. And we gotta have convictions about what the Bible actually says. Go to First Peter chapter two. Come on. First Come <laughs> Peter chapter two, starting in verse six. Now, not every single Bible study is like that at Boston Amen. University. Uh, so there are some good Bible studies, and please be praying for Christian. Uh, Christian is super close to getting baptized. All American swimmer, phenomenal guy. <laughs> Uh, but he needs a lot of prayer, so please be praying for him. And uh, he's basically praying to decide when he actually wants to get baptized as a disciple. So, awesome. so please keep him in your prayers. But First Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 6. It says, For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe... The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We'll stop right there. Now, many of us know this passage, obviously, from what we call the light and darkness study, because it lays out that you're either in the light or you're in the darkness, and there's no yeah. twilight zone. And so that's, I mean, that's awesome, because that means God makes it very clear. He makes it very clear whether or not we're lost or whether or not we're saved. And so it also lays out, though, exactly how we come into the light. Well, we have to be a people of God, and it starts with believing in Jesus. But it says that people who don't believe in Jesus, they stumble because they disobey the message. Hmm. And so it's very interesting. In the passage is an assumption. And the assumption is, is that if you actually believe in Jesus, you will obey Jesus. That's the assumption. But very often what you find today is people that, quote unquote, believe in Jesus without having any conviction at all that they need to obey him. And so biblically, that's not belief. Mm. That's not belief because belief in Jesus assumes that you would actually follow him mm -hmm. in the Bible. And that's why you're no longer in darkness. Because when you obey Jesus, your life changes a lot. Wow. And for those who have made that decision, you know what I'm talking about. You think about your old life and it's a lot differently. It's, it's going a lot differently than your present life yeah. because you've decided not just to intellectually believe, but to actually obey the message. And this is what makes people stumble. This is what makes people fall because confronted with obedience, it's a very difficult decision that not a lot of people choose to make. This means that a true conviction has to travel from your head to your heart. Mm. It's got to be something that you believe in your heart. And when you believe it in your heart, then it's what you do. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Mm -hmm. If it's in your heart, it's what you do. I was thinking a lot about this recently because I read this book. Uh, some of you might have read it. It's called The Kite Runner. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's like phenomenal. <laughs> it's really, really good. And I would say the overall message of the book is basically redemption. And it's redemption for the main character who had made some pretty bad decisions when he was younger. Decisions basically to, instead of fight for what's right and fight for the people that he loves, 
he basically decided to be a coward and to betray the people that he loves. Mm. And this did a, a lot of damage in his life, but by the end of the movie, he learns that he needs to basically be a different person and he, and he redeems himself. And I won't get into it. If you ever want to read the book yourself, it's, it's really, really good. It's a, it's a tearjerker for sure. It's really good. Mm. But I was reflecting on this and I realized that there were people in the book who had given him this example, the right example, that when times were tough and crazy, they decided to take a stand for other people and do what was right, even at the expense and the risk of their own life. Wow. And so the main character's dad was actually like this. His dad actually stood up for a woman who was about to be raped by a soldier, stood in between the soldier and the woman, and was willing to die for this woman that he didn't even know. And then basically another soldier, soldier came in and rescued everybody. So he saw this in his life, but he had over and over again chosen to do the opposite. Mm. And I was thinking, I was like, wow, like what gives somebody that level of courage? And I realized it just kind of like dawned on me, well... That kind of courage comes from a deep conviction where you understand that doing what is right and being righteous or, or taking a stand for God is something that God is going to see as valuable and God is going to protect you when you do those things. Come on. Right? And so if you believe that and you find yourself in a crazy situation, well, then you're going to do what's right, even if it means that you could be killed because you actually believe that God is going to protect you. Wow. You actually believe that God is more powerful than the person who's threatening you. Wow. And if you believe that, if you actually believe that, then it gives you the courage to do crazy things like that, to put your life in between some, some threat in somebody else's life that you love. Amen. And that's really what a conviction is all about. You know, for me, I was like, this is powerful stuff. This is stuff that if I were to apply this to my life, I mm -hmm. could actually share my faith in any situation. Right. You know what I mean? Because you know how many times you've been in that situation where you're like, I really should probably say, say something right here, but I don't want to. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But if you Come see on, spiritually, if you have a conviction God's going to protect you, then it gives you the courage to be confident about sharing your faith even in that situation. Come on. And there's plenty of different examples that you can think of in your own mind. But our beliefs have to travel. They have to travel from here to here Come to become on. convictions in our hearts. Go to Le Leviticus chapter 17. Now, I think when our convictions travel, it becomes repentance. Amen. But we also have to realize that it's not really our repentance that necessarily saves us. Although it is true that we're called to repent. There's a little bit more to it. Leviticus chapter 17 Verse 10. Cool little, you know, Old Testament scriptures. <laughs> Le Leviticus 17, verse 10. It says, I will set my face against any Israelite or any foreigner residing among, among them who eats blood, and I will cut them off from the people. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Therefore, I say to the Israelites, none of you may eat blood, nor may any foreigner residing among you eat blood. We'll stop right there. Hmm. Interesting passage in Le Leviticus 17, and it's explaining why the Israelites practiced animal sacrifice. Because they didn't believe that it was their repentance that led to forgiveness. Hmm. They believed that their sin had already put them in a place where they couldn't atone for it by their own actions. And so they did the sacrifice because God says the only thing that's valuable enough to account for sin, which the wage of which is death, is the life of some animal. Mm. It's blood. So blood is the only thing valuable enough to atone for sin. And so they would sacrifice the animals over and over and over again to make up for, to atone for the sins that they committed. And of course, there's no animal that's valuable enough. Their blood's not valuable enough to atone for all sin. And so that was the problem. Mm -hmm. That's why you needed Jesus. That's why Jesus had to come into the world and be the ultimate sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But the idea here is that even if you believe and even if you repent, you still can't earn your salvation. Mm -hmm. You can't earn your salvation because there's still an atonement that needs to take place. God needs to cover it over. There's a cost. Our sin has a consequence and God has to cover it over. And so this is why in Christianity, it's not enough just to believe and repent. You also need to be baptized. Mm -hmm. Go to John chapter 1. Come on. Now, a lot of times when I study the Bible with people, they don't understand this concept. And there's other religions that have removed this. 
actually from their faith. What do I mean by that? Well, if you read the Quran, the Quran actually says that Jesus is a prophet. Hmm. And the Quran acknowledges that Jesus was a powerful leader amongst God's people. But the Quran says that Jesus never died on the cross. Whoa. And he never physically resurrected from the dead. So the Quran basically agrees with everything that we believe about Jesus, but it takes out one part. It takes out the atonement. Right. Hmm. It takes out the cross. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Well, why? Well, when I think about, well, what does Satan want to do? Satan wants to keep us from going to heaven. So what's the most clever thing you could possibly do? Come up with a religion that basically says all the same things, but leaves out the most important part. Wow. The atonement of sins, mm-hmm. the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's intense stuff to think about, but it's true. Yeah. John chapter 1, verse 29 The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Mm. Jesus was Mm. introduced to the world with the title Lamb of God. Why? Because he's the sacrifice. His blood poured out on the cross was the ultimate atonement. So it doesn't matter how many people sin now. As long as they repent and get baptized into Christ, Jesus' blood is valuable enough to cover all of it up. He can atone for all of it. All we got to do now is we don't have to worry about the law of Moses. Let's just go find people who want to be disciples and baptize them. There's enough blood for everybody. Come on. We don't even have to make the sacrifices anymore because the ultimate sacrifice has been made. You know, this is huge. Fundamentally, what Muslims believe is that if you do more good deeds than bad deeds, you'll be saved. That's basically what they believe. And that, I believe, is fundamentally what everyone believes. (laughs) If you just do more good than bad then, amen, you're, you're a good person. God will welcome you. <laughs> yeah. But that's not the way it works. Our sin has a cost and has a consequence, and we have to take responsibility for it. And so there's an atonement, and the atonement happens through Jesus Christ. Come on. Go to Romans chapter 6. Come Romans 6 verse 1, and that's why we have this passage. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. We'll stop right there. You know, this is what it's all about. God is offering us forgiveness. And that is the greatest thing you could ever receive. Mm. (laughs) You know, if you hurt somebody's feelings, but you actually love them, it's actually really upsetting for you too. Mm -hmm. Because you know that that's caused damage in your relationship with them. But what is the most healing moment is when that person looks you in the eyes and says, I forgive you. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, this is awesome. (laughs) <laughs> and you might even be closer now to that person than you were before. Mm. Yeah. Because now there was a hardship, but there was forgiveness. Mm. Baptism is so amazing. It's so glorious. It's such a beautiful thing to witness because when somebody is actually a disciple and they understand what it is, now all of their sin, past, present, and future, God has spoken into their life and said, I forgive you. Wow. Mm. Your sin is atoned for and I've covered it with the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, which is my son. That's why that's a powerful moment. That's why we all love our own baptism and we never forget it and we're like fired up when somebody else gets baptized. Wow. Because this is what it's all about. You know, the challenge here from point number one is just to ask yourself, do you understand the responsibility that you've been given as a disciple? The responsibility to lead people into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's not just belief, it's repentance But really, it's also about baptism. And it's helping people to be united with their creator. Mm -hmm. Point number two, the responsibility of the mission. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Come on, bro. Come on. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, 
for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. We'll stop right there. You know, God's heart is that he wants everybody in the world to be saved. Um, A lot of times when we learn sort of about the narrow road, the temptation is to think God doesn't love people. But that's not the the truth. God wants everybody to be saved, but he can't change reality to do it. We all need to make decisions to acknowledge who God really is and to actually put him first in our life and to be baptized. But God wants everybody to be saved. Now, what was cool is I was reading the scripture the other day and I realized something that I hadn't totally realized before. In verse 1, it says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Wow. So it's saying God wants all people to be saved, but then really the admonishment to Timothy and to all of us through the Holy Spirit is that what do we have to do to see this through? Well, first of all, we need to pray. We need to pray for everybody. Wow. For me, I think, oh, first of all, I need to go share my faith and then do like a thousand Bible studies. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? That's what I think. But actually, that's not what this says. It says, I urge then, first of all, that you pray for everybody. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about it, and I was realizing that, wow, I do not pray for everybody. Mm -hmm. I don't pray for everybody. So I've neglected my very first and primary duty to save all people Mm -hmm. by not praying enough for everybody. Because it's God who's going to bring these people into a relationship with him, not me. I'm a tool, but it's not me. It's God. And so I need to get down on my knees, and I need to do my very first duty. I need to pray. I need to pray for all people. That's amazing. You know, I think this is really important because when we pray for these things, well, number one, we understand it's not about us, which is very helpful because when it's all about you, the burden becomes pretty heavy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But when it's about God, you're like, okay, Praise God. (laughs) We can do something here. But it also helps us to stay focused on our purpose. The entire purpose of life is actually to go to heaven. (laughs) Amen. Adam and Eve messed it up. Amen. (laughs) I was was talking to someone. I was like, we we all need to forgive Adam and Eve. (laughs) I forgive you, Adam and Eve. They must say amen. But God wants us all to to go to heaven. That's the purpose. Let's pray about it. Let's really pray about it. Now, later on in this passage, it does say, lift up your holy hands in prayer. Mm -hmm. And so there's an expectation when you pray, not just that you lift up your hands, Mm -hmm. but that your hands are holy. That just means that you have clean Mm -hmm. hands, right? You have a pure heart. You have a clean conscience. You're not intentionally in sin and asking God to do things for you. But you have a pure heart and you're petitioning your Lord because you know that it's by his power that people will be saved. Which means that we have to be an example for people. We were saying the Bible, Christian, um, as I was sharing earlier, and Christian's a super awesome guy, super sharp guy. And we're doing a Bible study, and he was talking about Gandhi. And he said, have you ever heard the story of Gandhi? And I I was, very general question. So I was like, well, I mean, I know who Gandhi is, but what do you mean? He's like, oh, well, there's a story about this woman who went to Gandhi and brought her son. And she said to Gandhi, my son is addicted to sugar. Please teach him how to not be addicted to sugar anymore. Basically help him to repent of his sugar addiction. <laughs> and then Gandhi said, okay, come back in two weeks and I'll help him. So she leaves for two weeks, she comes back, and uh, you know she brings her son to Gandhi, and Gandhi grabs her son, pulls him aside, and says, stop eating sugar. <laughs> and then the, the mom was like, well, what was that all about? Why didn't you just tell him that two weeks ago? And he said, well, I had to stop eating sugar and change my lifestyle before I could tell him to change his. Wow. wow. And it, that was it. So it wasn't complicated. Somebody just needed to tell the boy what to do. <laughs> but before you tell him what to do, you better be doing it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the whole, whole purpose of Gandhi right there. Go to Haggai chapter 1. Come on, Gandhi. <laughs> Stop it. Haggai chapter 1, verse 3. I always, get, I always get lost in the minor prophets. It's like a labyrinth. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah me too. <laughs> They always stick to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Haggai chapter 1, verse 3. <laughs> it says, Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. 
You put on clothes but are not worn. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Oh. I was sharing this scripture with the men. And I was like, just, just ignore that it says you carry a purse. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have a wallet with holes in it. Listen. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see it turn out to be little. What you brought home I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, which each of you is busy, while each of you is busy with your own house. We'll stop right there. Mm. You know, this time, basically, the Jews had been in exile for 70 years. They had been finally let go, and this was just literally a miracle because God just used a secular king to free them and send them back to their homeland to rebuild the temple. <laughs> but basically, the command here is if you want to rebuild the temple, then you have to stop focusing on your life first mm. and start focusing on putting God's temple above your own houses. And that was the command here from God to the Israelites through the prophet Haggai. Now, I think that in a very real way, this applies to us today. Well, why? Okay, not because we need to rebuild the temple. Uh, the temple's gone. We're all the temple. Amen. But it's because Christianity is completely obliterated. Mm. Right? There's 40,000 different denominations of Christianity. There's literally thousands of different doctrines about what it means to be a Christian and how do you actually live that out. And that's why disciples need to have convictions and really decide to put God's kingdom first because if they don't, then the temple will not be rebuilt. Mm. And that's what it's all about. That's why we have Crown of Thorns Project. That's why we have Operation Eagle. That's why we do all the crazy things that we do all the time. Because we're literally trying to rebuild the temple so that people can be saved. Come and on. it's confusing. I mean, when you sit down with enough people and you do enough Bible studies, you realize people are super confused. Yeah. Because they've heard a million different opinions about what the Bible teaches and nobody lays it out for them in a clear way. Yeah. Right. And so there's a lot of work to do to rebuild the temple of the Lord. But to do this, we need to make the sacrifice and decide that our home is not as important. Mm. Our home is not as important as the kingdom of God. And when you get into the nitty gritty of that, that means your finances will prioritize the kingdom. Your time will prioritize the kingdom. Your family <laughs> will mm. prioritize the kingdom because you understand that it's time to build the temple mm. and it's not time to focus on our own lives. Come on. Mm. The warning is that if we don't have this conviction, then we'll try to build our own lives and it'll, it'll be like putting money in a purse or a wallet that has holes in it. <laughs> yeah. It's just going to go right through mm. because God's not going to bless that. If we're trying to be disciples and we're not putting the temple first, God's not going to bless that. Now, I believe this takes a pure heart. Yeah. Like, it, like to me, the most important thing as a disciple is a pure heart. Yeah. Go to Luke chapter 4. Come on. And we're going to close it out after this passage here. Luke chapter 4, verse 5. <laughs> now, Jesus, of course, was perfect. <laughs> so Jesus never messed up. He didn't make this mistake. In fact, Jesus was homeless. <laughs> but it, takes, it takes a lot of faith to pull that off. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm glad they fired both my jokes and kids came. Uh, Luke chapter five. Luke chapter four, verse five. But anyway, for us, we can imitate Jesus, right? But it doesn't doesn't mean that Jesus wasn't tempted. Look at one of the temptations here that Satan brought before Jesus. Verse five, Luke chapter four. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Mm. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus, before he even started his ministry, was tempted by Satan that he could literally have everything that he wanted. Now, I think this is kind of ironic because Jesus already had all the authority in heaven and on earth. So it's almost like a futile temptation to put before Jesus. Because he's, yeah. he's God in the flesh. But really what Satan's trying to get him to do, he's trying to get him to sell out. He's trying mm -hmm. to get him to focus on his own life, be rich, be powerful, have status, have the comfort, have all those things, instead of making the sacrifices and going to the cross. Mm. Which Jesus died on the cross at 33, the prime of his life, right? Wow. I mean, I'm about to turn 33 November 1st. <laughs> I've never been more terrified of death. 
<laughs> Why? Because I have a wife and I have a baby and I want to have another baby. <laughs> Jesus sacrificed <laughs> all that. Jesus said, forget all that. I got to build the kingdom. Wow. And he sacrificed his life. But the temptation was there to serve himself. And he decided to serve God. Mm. This is the refinement of life, right? This mm. is the refinement of life. We need to decide to put God first. Uh, I said that was my last passage, and I totally forgot I want to read one more. Go to Malachi okay. chapter 3. I promise you this is the last passage. Right here. <laughs> Malachi chapter 3. It's too good to pass up. Malachi 3 verse 3. <clears throat> so every now and then you find nuggets on Facebook. Yeah. Facebook? Yeah, this little nugget I found on Facebook. Malachi 3, verse 3. It says, Send it, bro. <laughs> <yeah. Come on. laughs> Malachi 3, verse 3. It says, He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. Wow. So this, in Malachi 3, we usually read 6 through 12, where it talks about do not rob God with your tithes and offerings. Here in verse 3, this is a phenomenal passage. And it's saying God refines us in life, same way that silver and gold is refined, so that we would have the right heart when we give our offerings. <laughs> wow. So if you ever wonder why you're suffering, it's also it's so that you can have a good heart when you give contribution and special missions. Come on. That's basically it. You're like, why am I suffering? Oh, it's for special missions. Amen. Mm-hmm. I have to have a pure heart right here when I give my offerings to God. Come on. Pretty intense, but that's really what the passage is saying. Now, this is the nugget I found on Facebook, okay? <laughs> so this is cool. So a Come shepherd uh, in the New York church posted this story. And it was a woman doing Bible study. They read Malachi 3.3. 3, and she said, you know what? I'm really interested by this passage. How is silver and gold refined? So she spends the next week investigating it. Mm-hmm. She looks up a silversmith. She goes and visits his place. Mm-hmm. I don't know what you call those. And, yeah. uh, and then he's, she just forge. like, uh, what is it called? It's a forge. A forge. Wow. This is like medieval times. <laughs> <laughs> so she goes to the forge. And uh, she doesn't tell the guy why she's there. She just says, hey, I just want to see the process of refining silver and what it looks like. So the guy grabs his tool, which he uses to put the silver in the furnace. He grabs the piece of silver, and he puts it in the furnace, and he sits down, and he, he holds it in the hottest part of the furnace. So it's the middle of the fire, the hottest part of the furnace. And she asked him why he does that, and he said it's because it needs to be in the hottest part so it melts away all of the impurities in the silver. And then he sits there, and he's just kind of staring at it for a while. And she asked him, why are you sitting down? Can't you just, like, you know, like leave it here, and it'll just kind of sit there, and you don't even have to be here? He's like, no, you actually have to sit down, and you have to watch it. You have to keep your eyes on the silver, and you can't take your eyes off of it. And she asks him why, and he says it's because, basically, if it burns too long, then it will become damaged, and you can't use that silver. And so I need to find out, but it hasn't gone too far, and then I pull it out, and it's ready. And then she says, oh, wow, well, then how do you know when it's totally pure? Like, how do you know at the right time to pull it out? And he said, oh, that's easy. When all the impurities have finally melted off, I can see my reflection perfectly in the silver. Wow. And so then I pull it out. I was like, whoa, this is cool. (laughs) So why do we get refined? Because God's trying to see himself in us. Wow. Right? We're being made in the image of Christ. We're being made in the image of Christ so we can give our offerings with a pure heart. (laughs) It's pretty cool. That's what it says. Wow. Um, So this is what it's about, right? It's about the mission. The mission takes sacrifice. It takes financial sacrifice. We literally decide to focus on building the kingdom instead of building our own homes. Mm -hmm. That's the cost of helping people to be saved. Of course, we uh, have our special missions goal this coming up here. And so that's the challenge. We all look at our budget <laughs> and we go, what am I going to build right here? <laughs> Ooh, baby. And then, then it gets real. And, uh, and then we just make sacrifices. And that's the example that Charmaine and I have always tried to give uh, to those that we lead. And I just have a conviction that I'll empty my bank account if that's what it takes. Now, I don't expect everybody to have the same faith as me, but I expect everybody to do it, everything that they can to make their goal. Amen. Because this is the mission that we're a part of, Amen. to build God's kingdom. Amen. Amen. And so that's really the challenge for point number two. But to close it out here, the goal is to take responsibility. <laughs> to take responsibility for the mission in our own walk with God and then in helping other people to be saved as well. Let's say a prayer here for our communion. Amen.